Good evening and welcome back to Vegas October One Sounds. Tonight I'm going to be covering Volley 9 and this is the first in probably a series of three or four videos which takes a look at Volley 9 in depth from the perspective of at least 10 different locations around uh, the venue that evening. Part of the impetus for this is to give um, people a greater understanding of the depth of research that this channel does on various uh, aspects of the shooting. And I do that both from uh, multiple recordings, uh, within a recording multiple volleys and within each volley multiple uh, gunshots. And in this quest, basically, I've come up with a standard set of videos which I use to um, reference things. And the, there's about a dozen of them. And I chose these dozen because they demonstrate certain aspects of the sounds that need to be understood. And just as importantly, they're uh, fairly clean signals. So I have a a criteria and that criteria is um, multifaceted and the things that I look for in a good source are uh, a good signal to noise ratio and what that means is that the signal of interest in, in our case gunshots can be clearly distinguished from all the other sounds that are occurring for many videos that are recorded downtown in the venue, that is in the middle portion of the venues, there's a lot of background noise. And sometimes the gunshot signals get clouded and or covered by those uh, background noises. I also, uh, in these 10, 10 or 12 videos, require that every single muzzle blast for the volleys of interest can be isolated and I can measure them and have measured them. And uh, for the supersonic cracks, I require that most of them also be uh, readily available, clear, and uh, measurable. Um, the muzzle blasts have all been measured by hand, not so much with the sonic. Um, the supersonic cracks, which I oftentimes rely upon a program that I wrote to extract them out. And I do that because a lot of times um, the nature of a supersonic crack is such that it's not real apparent when it occurs. And the software, while giving me lots of options, and a lot of false positives is generally better at eking out some that are hidden within the background noise and then it makes suggestions and I go and I look at them and select the ones which I feel are qualified candidates. Um, also I'd like I focus on um, videos which are static that is the person doing the recording does not move around a lot because that way I can tell a great deal more about uh, the video and the shots in it relative to other static videos. Now that's not to say a video which is moving doesn't give me information, it does, but it gives me a different kind of information in a different way. And static uh, locations are just the simplest to deal with. Um, If there's something that's really interesting about a video, I sometimes I'll put it in there. Uh, for example, um, the Goodwin video. I thought that was really fascinating because its location is the uh, essentially the only video that's furthest south of the venue relative to where the shooting is and it's not clear initially anyway what was happening with that video and so I included it in one of the standard ones as a point of reference and comparison and that's the name of the game is comparing these videos across many different locations comparing them to each other and seeing what we can dig out of the audio 
and you know this isn't a st isn't a um, a fixed set of videos this is you know an evolving situation but you know it's been a couple years down and these videos tend to get the job done when I need to answer some questions um, so ultimately the goal of this volley nine in-depth look is to come up with and explain some of the things that I understand about gunshot acoustics and how that can be applied when interpreting uh, situations. And uh, particularly we're headed towards looking at uh, the Brian Shields video where he pulls up three different um, videos and overlays some audio from each one and compares it to one of them singly and then asks or suggests that perhaps this audio uh, is indicative of a sniper and I'm, I'm going to answer that question and I'll answer it directly but uh, not tonight and the reason we're not answering that question tonight is because you first have to understand the, where I'm coming from what I know and what te techniques can be applied to uh, clearly address that question all right so these are the names that I give uh, the in this case 10 there's a couple there's a, there's some more that I don't use as frequently but these are the 10 most common ones that I refer to and I give them names and in the comments none of the comments but in the description I'll put the video links to all 10 of these maybe even more depends on where I get tonight but I would just want to give you a brief uh, overview of what each one is does and where it's located Bus refers to the bus stop out in front of the Mandalay Bay. And that one's selected because it's further enough, well, I don't want to prejudge this. Um, it has a signal that isn't so loud as to be um, corrupt and full of lots of echoes. Uh, and so it represents one of the closest points to what I feel is where the, the source of the shooting is. Uh, that is not burdened by a tremendous amount of echoing or distortion or refraction. And refraction is a technical term re referring to how the signal gets to you in a non-direct path situation. Normally most of these videos have line of sight and that's what gives them the good signal quality. Um, Hebrew is a video location in the, in the um, Luxor parking lot which is right outside the, the front entrance, just uh, south of it. And again, it has a direct line of sight right to the north wing of Mandalay Bay. And it is by far the best recording of Volley 9 that I've found to date. And so it's the gold standard. It's the gold standard. No echoes, uh, line of sight, no background noises, nothing. It's just a pristine signal. The Excalibur represents the far end of the spectrum in terms of distance away from the uh, shooting location. Yet even at the distance that the Excalibur Hotel is, these people still had line of sight and it recorded both all the muzzle blasts and all the supersonic shocks, mostly. So it represents what is possible in terms of distance. Similarly, um, Oasis is, is another reference point. Oasis Apartments, uh, which is, you know, essentially due east of Mandalay Bay proper um, at quite a distance. It's out there in the field um, where the, actually the guy shot from on top of one of the buildings but out at the Oasis apartment there's not a lot of activity around so the background noise is quite um, soft and because of that the signal to noise ratio is high and we can hear things there that you would not be able to expect to hear or, or cannot be heard in a uh, closer setting simply because the background noise is too loud uh, to hear some of the finer detail. And it also has the um, um, unique distinction of being able to explain why we 
have or some of the aspects of how supersonic cracks are propagated because it's at such a large angle to the projectile bullet path that the time at which you hear the the uh, supersonic crack and the time at which you hear the muzzle blast are very very close together so it's what we call a low lag situation and it's also at such a distance that like the Excalibur there's some unique phenomena going on with sounds there because high frequency sounds over large distances tend to lose their high frequency component and leave only the lower frequency portion of the uh, signal involved which means that the greater the distance the more a supersonic crack begins to sound and look like a muzzle blast because muzzle blasts tend to on average be lower frequency than supersonic cracks and then of course we have the taxi which most people feel is the uh, Zagruder film for uh, this event and it theoretically represents the closest recordings of uh, several of the volleys. Then we have uh, the Raymond Page, which I call Ray. Uh, I think everybody is familiar with Raymond Page. It's on the sidewalk up at, you know, near Gate 2 uh, on the boulevard. And it's kind of a noisy background, but yet we can still distinctly see uh, Volley 9 in all its glory. And then we have Under, which is probably the most referenced uh, video of all these by myself, because Under is a video that uh, is recorded near the center of the stage with people essentially crawling, crawled underneath the stage. And they don't really have line of sight to the Mandalay Bay yet the signals are still very strong and very clear and that's a, a phenomena that people have to understand is that sound doesn't require line of sight it just gives a better signal if you have line of sight uh, but again you know the under has very strong signal for many volleys for both the muzzle blast and the supersonic cracks Nine seven nine nine under bar seventy two and thirty four under bar triple one four are both officer patrol cams, and as you can see, this list uh, is dominated by non officer patrol cams, simply because for the longest time officer patrol cams weren't released, and uh, this small sampling, both of these have pretty decent signals. All right, so if you need to know the sources, go to the description. Uh, that was a basic overview. Tonight I'm going to be talking almost exclusively about the uh, Hebrew and the under. And I've chosen those because they represent the uh, almost the extremes of what I call the lag phenomena or the delay between the arrival of the supersonic crack and the muzzle blast. So the lag for the Hebrews location is very small or smallish shall we say and the lag for the under is tends to be large for volley 9. There are larger and there are smaller but those two represent um, a prototype to look at and, th and from those two prototypes by comparing them you can start to understand how uh, things work with gunshot acoustics. All right. So with that said, let's get to volley nine. <coughs> this is an amplitude plot of volley nine, and this is the what I call the pristine signal for volley nine, taken from the Hebrew film. Let's uh, pull up. A map here and let's see if see um, I need to show you exactly where this is okay this is the Las Vegas shooting map project which I use 
every day dozens of times and this is a Google Maps and on top of it is overlaid a bunch of dots now the uh, map has this this is the audio right here that I'm using it's called the Vostovec Vosh it's tech, however you would say that however the location is really not there the location is really up there and I determine it that by uh, reviewing the when I ran my uh, simulation of delays or the synchronization experiment where I synchronized a bunch of these volley nines together and I discovered that the timing was off because the location and distances were off and I then went back and reviewed the video and looked at it carefully and found that it was uh, essentially right here next to the um, the Sphinx which is the entrance to the hotel just below it and right right in that region so that's the he what I call the Hebrew and then the other one I'll be using this evening which I call under is this one and I think actually that one's just a little bit under something I can't quite make out the location of the part they're under but as you can see it's it's near the middle of the stage right up in the front row area and uh, that to me represents a prototypical good signal from the venue proper and those are the two I'm going to be talking about to start with tonight and the reason there's only two is because there's a lot of things to go over um, I'm kind of making this video for uh, people who aren't so familiar with the channel and so there'll be a lot of concepts which uh, longtime viewers uh, find repetitive but not in a way that isn't uh, doesn't help and so for the new time people people who are seeing this video as one of the first you need to go to my channel and um, read the very first or view anyway the very first video that I did which is this one introduction or intro to acoustic gunshot analysis uh, because uh, before we get much further into the video if you don't understand the concepts in there then you know the going through this volley nine exercise is probably going to be a little bit more cumbersome for you so by all means go back and, and uh, uh, read that all right so let's go back to our uh, volley nine signal you know you pick up a a video you listen you look at it you listen to it you listen to it a couple more times then you pull that uh, video into a um, a uh, tool of some kind that can help that can show you uh, what the signal looks like because about five to ten percent of all the information that I use is garnered from listening and the rest is garnered from using various tools to look at the signal and this is the ROST form of the signal which is an amplitude plot and it shows us a graph which goes up and down on the y-axis of how strong the signal is versus time and so we see that volley 9 is kinda unique it's kinda unique in that it's one of the few volleys to have uh, this pattern of, of sounds we have three portions to it I call them bursts uh, I call this one nine, burst 9A, I call the center one burst 9B, and I call the third one burst 9C. And um, each of these has a different number of rounds fired, and there's a gap between each of them. And that gap and those counts form a unique signature that can be quickly identified <coughs> in most um, videos so where does volley 9 fit in the big picture volley 9 fits right here in this region okay and as you can see uh, this graph which shows videos over time that I've looked at 
that there's more than you know eight or nine of those videos that occur near um, 10 p.m. plus for you know let's say uh, 385 seconds and I have a graph somewhere that shows me the precise time and I'll pull that up in a minute so volley 9 occurs uh, further than halfway through this whole event and it occurs just prior to this fairly large gap here and after you know there's been some round you know one two three it's the fourth volley after a very large quiet period so it's about we'll see if you measure about two-thirds of the way through the shooting so um, when did it occur precisely how many bullets and uh, what's the structure of those things before we get into the signal analysis as many of you of you know I have for all of these standard videos measured every single muzzle blast that's available in the um, video and I've compiled them into Excel worksheets and a database and so here we are this is um, all of the videos that this run anyway of of the information examined of which there let's see 12 but only but two of them have uh, less than a comp full complement because 13 120 and 7 under bar 45 simply haven't got to filling out the rest so I only needed to look at volley uh, 9a uh, for some reason which contains seven shots yes do you need something do you need something anyway I had to answer a question there so uh, back to these as you can see from this column P here uh, all this volley 9 occurred in at 10 p.m. 12 minutes 34 seconds plus or, or minus uh, some milliseconds so every single one of them occurred uh, at approximately the same time which is good for us um, doesn't mean anything in particular it's just that if you have a video and you have a time it, you know you can come through this chart and say oh yeah well the nearest volley occurring at that time is is this these particular times are aligned with uh, the Las Vegas shooting project uh, because it's the most readily available source of timing uh, for lots of videos Um, the other thing that's uh, noticeable from this chart is that there are precisely 100 rounds fired during every single volley 9 that was recorded. Oops, wait a minute, there's one under as 101. I lied. So, for some reason that one has recorded an extra muzzle, whether that's an error or an oversight or whatnot, I don't know, but I'll have to look at it. And let's see, so that means is the duration longer? Let's see, so the duration on all these is 9.3 seconds. Don't know. I have to look at that very carefully. It would seem that since the average time is shorter, there must be something going on there. Probably not. I'll look at it here soon, and I didn't realize that it had 101 shots. So anyway, if I take this and I break it down into individual volleys, and this is a hyperlinked um, set of worksheets, probably a hundred worksheets in this book, I can come down and look at you know the individual things. We have 9A, 9B, and 9C, and there we go there's the extra one for some reason I counted one extra round in 
uh, volley 9a for that. But anyway, so volley 9a has seven, typically seven rounds, 9b 71, and 9c 22 rounds. And we get the duration, the RPM. What, in fact, let's look at the RPM. The RPM for 9b, 9 bit, volley 9b tends to run around 648. The RPM for 9c tends to run around 600. 56, which eh, that's close enough. But if we go up here to 9A, then we see that it's 577. So volley 9A, or burst 9A really, is a little slower than the other portions of um, the volley 9. And that tends to indicate that uh, well, just something else going on there. Maybe you know, since these are probably bump stocks, it was uh, a different gun. No, not a different gun. It's probably all the same gun. A little bit less force applied onto it, or the person wasn't as focused, or, or whatever. All right, so we've identified the times of all these things. We identified the rounds. Um, now let's go back to the signal. This is the signal, like I said, for the Hebrew video out by the Luxor entrance. And if we look at this on a zoomed in scale, we'll s see that, you know, there's not a lot of uh, noise in between each of these spikes, which represent a signal of interest. Okay. Now you notice that every other signal is slightly different. There tends to be a pattern here. Every other signal is large, is a large followed by a small, large followed by, that one's pretty big, uh, smallish, I mean larger rather. And so we can see that while there's a general pattern, there are differences. And let's go to 9A, which was a slower rounds per minute, and look at that. Uh, just looking at this signal, you can see that there's some difference. In other words, the, the amplitude of these things are a little bit more uniform. And you can see, though, that they do come in groups of two. Okay, now, I said that there were seven rounds on this. And yet, if we look at this, we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 peaks. And as anybody who's been around this channel long knows that one of these peaks, namely the first one, is, is the supersonic crack, and the second one is the muzzle blast. And while you can't readily identify them here, uh, we can identify them with a spectrogram. This is an amplitude plot. So basically we're getting two good signals for every round that was fired. And this one looks like there might be something else going on there. You see there's a, a little bit of a spurious sound there. And I'll look at that more carefully when I show you the spectrogram. But by and large this is a very clean signal. And then these little spikes out there are most likely reflections from either the ground or from a surface that's, you know, um, nearby. And we know they're reflections because they're so, such scaled down versions of these. And there's timing and spacing is the same as a couple of these last ones. And once again, I'll examine that more carefully in the spectrogram view. <coughs> spectrogram view. All right, so here we are. We're on Hebrew. We've got an amplitude plot. It looks like a clean signal. It looks like we have signals for both the um, supersonic crack, which is produced by the the bullet, and the uh, muzzle blast, which is produced by the gases that expand out the tip. So let's flop our little bodies over to a spectrogram. We just enable it, actually. This is a, a power spectrogram, and what it does is kind of measure the energy related with each um, sound. And if we were to overlay on top of that the waveform plot, we could get an idea, and we zoom in, uh, what's going on here. 
we see that the energy w in this green portion, which is the power spectrogram, or dB squared in this case really, uh, the brighter it is, the more dense it is, the greater the energy. It also shows us what frequency bands that energy is um, being produced in. So we see by expanding out this out quite a bit, we begin to see what these spikes from the amplitude plot look like. That is, there's these lower frequency spikes and then there's these higher frequency spikes. That the uh, lower frequency spikes tend to have their energy all bundled up nice and neat down in, in a one small region, whereas the higher frequency spikes tend to have it spread out over a larger region. And from gunshot acoustic theories, we know that the higher frequency spikes are the supersonic cracks, and the lower frequency spikes are the muzzle blast. And we can see that they're separated in time by, by a distance, in this case, um, for that particular one, somewhere on the order of 38.5 milliseconds, or 0.038 seconds. So they're close together. That is, you know, 35 milliseconds is pretty small. Um, the ear can hear somewhere down to around 20 or 30 milliseconds. That is, if these were closer, we'd hear them as one sound. So we might actually hear these as two separate sounds. Depending upon who you are, you might hear them as one sound. But anyway, we begin to see that with this power spectrogram we can identify uh, which type of signal we're working with. And it's very, very important because um, the phys underlying physics of each type of sound is different. The muzzle blasts are very simple, uh, comparatively speaking, in their physics than the supersonic cracks. The muzzle blasts really only depend upon the size and magnitude of the initial blast at the gun um, plus how far away you are. And they tend to propagate outwards in all directions evenly or what we what we model as a spherical propagation. And uh, so their timing is very simple. You simply take that distance away from the uh, gun that they are and divide by the speed of sound and you have how long it takes that sound to get from the gun to you. The supersonic cracks on the other hand are, are very complex and I'm not going to even begin to touch on them this evening but suffice it to say that there, you cannot predict their a time of arrival so simply. You have to know not only the, uh, well, several things you have to know. You have to know the speed of sound, which we have to know for the muzzle blast also, but you have to know the speed of the bullet and the trajectory of the bullet and the recording location's relative distance to the bullet. And then from all those things, you, you can get a rough idea of what uh, the time of arrival would be. And um, I've, I've done that. I, you know, I, I've done all of that and I've measured the lags. This is what we call the lag. And typically I measure at the front of a burst and at the end of the burst. So if we want to measure the time of arrival difference for this volley, namely, uh, let's go for B1, uh, the second burst, the first shot. And actually, it's kind of hard because the, it, when it arrives, is it kind of overlaps with the next shot. So let's go to the tail end. Well, maybe we could get it back up there. Yeah, the first two. All right, so we're going to measure the first two here. And so again, bring up that measuring tool and measure the distance between those two. And once again, in this case, we're going to get uh, 37.1 milliseconds. So the lag, which is the time of difference of time of arrival between the supersonic crack and the muzzle, um, 
is about 37 uh, milliseconds. If I were to switch over to a different plot, this would be much, much easier. Here we go. <coughs> this is another spectrogram on the same exact signal, but what it does is divide it up into frequency better. That is, I do a logarithmic scale here so that these lower frequencies are more prominent. And just, it's the same way that our ears hear this. Our ears hear on a logarithmic scale. They don't hear on a linear scale, which is what this one is plotted as. So our ears, uh, with the logarithmic scale, we're emphasizing the frequencies from 2500 hertz on down. So here we can see quite clearly that this shot it has a much larger lower frequency component than this shot. Well, actually, they're both the same shot than this sound. And so we um, clear, clearly and quickly identify this as a muzzle and this is a supersonic crack. So then we um, bring up our measuring tool and then we measure the distance between them just like we did before, but it becomes a lot a lot easier to do. 36.2. Okay, so we're off a little bit. Now, we can do that for every shot. We can do that for every burst. We can do that for every volley. But each round, since it has a different uh, bullet trajectory, is going to have a different gap there. And that's the main problem with, you know, these supersonic cracks. If we had the same exact bullet path and everything, then, you know, they'd probably be about equal. But anyway, remember, let's just let's just abbreviate. This is 36 milliseconds. So we take that 36 milliseconds and we go over to my trusty lag map. And what I've done here is um, measured the lags for various rounds uh, on most everywhere around, around the venue that evening. And I plot them and the darker the color, the smaller the lag. So our 36 milliseconds being a small lag, uh, and we know roughly over here this location occurs in this dark blue slash purple region. The scale is down below here. So this is 80 milliseconds, 160 milliseconds, 240 milliseconds. Well, we know that 36 falls in the darkest of color, and so we know that it would uh, correspond to the darkest color and indeed it does because over here is the Luxor. And so you can get a kind of an idea based upon your location what to expect for the lag and you can get confirmation that when you measure the lag it corresponds and if it doesn't then you have a problem. But anyway, a lag plot. That's, that's a useful tool. It's a, one of these tools uh, that can give you a quick idea for example, if you have a video that's recorded here in the chicken shack, which is in this general vicinity in the middle of the venue, you'll see that you're either in yellow or the next color up, which uh, should give you somewhere between 0.32 to 0.5 or 0.48 seconds or 320 milliseconds to 480. For the under video, which we're going to examine next, which is right here let's get a bigger image of that there that's mostly in the yellow region so the yellow I would expect the lag on the under to be somewhere on the order of point th uh, 320 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds and we'll verify that when we get into the under uh, video alright so what do we have so far well we have this signal and now that we've got it on this frequency plot, which is a frequency versus time, or it's called a spectrogram, let's zoom out here and look at it in the bigger picture and see what we can see. Um, and trust me, this is going to get uh, more interesting real quick. Well, we can see that all those uh, muzzle blasts form this nice bright line along here and all those cracks, the supersonic cracks, form these nice bright lines up there. But somewhere around the middle here, we see that things change up a little bit for the cracks, which means that the bullet path changed. Because the further away you are from the bullet path, the i.e. the mist distance is large, then the uh, more distance the supersonic crack has to travel, and therefore the sound is softer. 
<clears throat> so this gun waved I can't tell precisely how much from this graph without a lot of announce how much it waved but it did alright that now that's relative to the Luxor and of course if you pick a different spot uh, the distance to the bullet is going to be different so what else can we tell from this of interest well what we can do since we can clearly identify each and every muzzle shot from this graph is to mark them down and so when I do that I will come up with a template that I can use to compare videos so I'll take and mark each of these shots which I've done for dozens and dozens of videos and I'll create this nice little thing which I'll show you in the next set of, of uh, things and I can compare each volley with them alright so that's uh, standalone volley 9 at the Luxor entrance called heat which I call Hebrew consisting of three bursts totaling a hundred shots oh yeah I was gonna look at why well, I think that there's no that's not the right one I, it was the under video I had looked at okay so there's a hundred rounds fired here there's two hundred unique sounds or more two for each round one muzzle one supersonic and now let's look at the next uh, video search which is under so I've already prepared a, um, a sonic visualizer session for that called Hero versus Under. So we take what we were just doing and we add another source of audio and in this case it's going to be from the um, under video which is on the bottom here and then we could compare the two alright so let's have a look at the under video on the bottom here kind of by itself so what we'll do since we already looked at the um, Lux the uh, Hebrew one so let's just get that out of the way well no let's leave it there okay the first thing you notice is that the top parts up here representing the supersonic snaps cracks or whatever you want to call them aren't as clean and distinct or evenly spaced as the ones from the Luxor and you say well, what the heck okay I'll explain that in a minute but then if you look here at the bottom you'll see that the um, muzzle blasts are very regularly spaced in fact if we were to uh, get these to a, a position to align and then you say well let's align them all right well let's align the two volleys from the two videos and you start to look over here and you say oh wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute how do we align these because if we look closely at this third burst here which is a good example it's longer it appears to have more shots namely you know the one on the top goes from here to there and you'll see that on the bottom even by moving it you can't make it fit no it doesn't do it like that you can't make it fit there's too many shots well that's not because there are actually more shots there are precisely the same number of shots in this volley for both of these videos it's that the supersonic crack and the muzzle blast are offset in the second video namely down here we have the supersonic cracks and then we have the muzzle blast and you'll notice that the first supersonic crack there has its corresponding muzzle blast over there or it's offset that's once again the lag and in this case of the under video we have about a point 
three something lag for under why well, remember I said I was going to check and verify that so let's check and verify it 0.34 which would be the yellow and if you'll recall that the yellow is what it would be expected for that location namely the stage is right there and the video is right there so it's in the yellow so confirmation things are as we would expect things are as we have observed and let's pop back over okay why is that offset well you know that is the, the million dollar question and it's not a simple thing to explain uh, but basically I'll give you the uh, two million dollar answer it is that the bullet travels fast enough to get to you quick so if you're close to the bullet it gets to you quick and you hear the supersonic crack quick which means that the muzzle blast which is only traveling at the speed of sound takes a while to catch up so if you're closer to the bullet it takes longer for the muzzle blast to catch up thereby the lag is greater if you're far away then the uh, bullet going in a different direction will produce the sound but it takes a while for that crack then to propagate to you therefore the distance gets reduced and you can express that in a hundred different ways but I think the lag plot expresses it the best okay so lag okay so given that the lags are going to be different for different locations how do you line these videos up you can't line up well can you what can we line up I think that becomes the question let's try to line up things here you can't let you line up the first sound heard with the first sound heard because that doesn't work okay but what we can notice and observe here is that if we line up the first muzzle blast from each one remember the muzzle blasts are the lower frequency things ie on the bottom of these scales okay so we've lined up the first one and then we drag this this line across and pick any one let's pick one let's pick that one right there then you'll see that they are pretty much lined up pick another one pretty much lined up pick another one pretty much lined up so what we've discovered that is that the muzzle blast for each video can be lined up with the next video why is that that's simply the nature of the physics of the way it propagates that is there's no component related to the position to the bullet trajectory it's all how you're related to the the uh, gun the muzzle blast because it comes out of the muzzle so if you eliminate the delay caused by the distance to the muzzle which is what we're doing by aligning then these uh, sounds which are each of the rounds being fired is the same that is to say that the muzzle blast times of arrival deltas the difference between them is preserved from video to video now that's a little bit of an exaggeration because it only works if both the shooter and the recording devices are not moving that's right if either the shooter or the recording device is moving then the time between these gaps changes so now right away you know we have a good indication that in this case uh, uh, neither the shooter nor the the recording devices were moving because the muzzle blast lined up and since we lined up one muzzle blast in this burst all of them should line up which uh, sonic visualizer isn't good at doing that but let's see if we if we can let's take the top push it over over to that red line with the first muzzle blast on the top pane on it same thing on the bottom here put the first muzzle blast of the third burst on there 
and then look at some of these others over here from the second burst let's see pick one let's pick that one yep lines up so no matter which shot or round you select if they're both videos are stationary then all the other rounds in that volley will line up and that's a big win in terms of understanding and analyzing these videos so you're not going to have spurious rounds show up unless there's other guns or something involved the opposite is not the case that is for supersonic cracks they can go all over the place because the bullet path is changing the supersonic crack time delay changes and so you exactly end up with what's happening here uh, with these bigger gaps these are gaps between these uh, supersonic cracks down here than was up there so you know when you're listening to this video you're not going to hear what you hear up there for the particularly for the supersonic cracks if you could overlay just the muzzle blast then you'd hear the same thing for the supersonic cracks it's never going to, well I can't say never it's rarely going to be the case that the supersonic cracks for the same exact volley line up okay well how can we make that more apparent that statement more apparent because the critical phenomena And actually, um, for this location on the second pane down here, you can see that there were the supersonic cracks actually were hard to come by. There's not many there. It's mostly just muzzle blasts. And we need to push it a little bit over there to line up the muzzle blasts. So on the second pane, <coughs> um, where are the supersonic cracks? this is the first part and what we mostly see are uh, strong muzzle waves down here but the supersonic cracks are disappearing you see the supersonic crack over here is strong uh, there there's a couple strong but these are all weak if in fact you know they're really hard to see you see them there showing up so what happened to them well the path of the bullet changed enough between uh, the second burst and the first burst that the supersonic crack was much generated at a much more distant location. And I'm not going to try to enumerate or calculate or quantify that, but suffice it to say that uh, you can lose supersonic cracks even though it's the same round as above. Let's get over to the first burst. and line up those things we've lost these supersonic cracks down here under uh, because of its location relative to the bullet path so that represents another problem when you're trying to line up audios from different locations these supersonic cracks are going to sound weird and funny uh, because their timing isn't preserved as we clearly demonstrated by by this I mean up on this top you know you got a supersonic crack always in close relationship to its muzzle blast down here they're separated by three tenths of a second and in this case they're kind of fuzzy too because um, the people are underneath something and so that causes more reflections and so they're spread out over more time so this under video isn't the best for supersonic cracks but it, it clearly demonstrates the problem when you're trying to align these videos uh, for sound comparison purposes. You can't just do that. Because when you do that, then um, you're going to get a whole bunch of extra stuff somewhere. Or you're going to be missing some pieces. <coughs> and so a naive person might come along and say, well, hey, this first burst here is a different gun because it doesn't have supersonic cracks bad statement or they might take 
uh, this first burst here. Let's draw it in. They might take and align these things and say, up here we hear uh, the supersonic cracks, but down here we don't, and oh, by the we don't hear any for the first shots, and then we hear some loud ones, therefore some other gun must have chimed in there. That also would be a naive statement. So, where do we go from here in terms of trying to understand um, all the ramifications of overlaying videos? Well, I think the basic general concept is that if you want to compare audios, you're going to have to drop into something like Sonic Visualizer where you can see what's actually going on because otherwise you're making assumptions that just aren't going to hold. And, you know, it's pretty clear that you're not always going to get the same signal it's pretty clear that these signals uh, degrade over distance. It's pretty clear that these signals degrade when you're underneath or near something that can cause reflections. It's pretty clear that because of the bullet trajectory that you can lose signal because you're too far away from the supersonic crack. It's pretty clear that in one volley from one, uh, one gun, which, you know, that hasn't been demonstrated by this, but presuming that's true, that with one gun you could have a whole different series of sounds generated. <clears throat> and so making blatant statements of, oh, I heard a loud sound or I didn't hear something, and therefore um, we have a unique phenomena. We have a sniper or uh, two guns or something else even on its face is not going to fly. So, um, so let's continue on though. Let's, what, how can we make sense of this stuff? Well, the way I make sense of it is this. I first look at the signal generally. I then isolate the muzzle blast. I can line up the videos based on the muzzle blast and say whether or not they have preserved the muzzle blast timing, which if they haven't, then there's something going on. They're moving, maybe. And so what I do is create this general template. And let's go ahead and... I don't see it as being a pain here. Maybe it is. Oh, yeah, I think I did. Oh, no. Move that up there. Let's add another pain. What I'm going to do now is... Um, how can I do this? Let's add a pane. Well, why don't we pull in another, another audio? Now, I haven't explained all the little details, but I, I think I've explained the general concept. Let's pull in another uh, video. Let's pull in the one from Oasis. So, add another audio source here. And we're going to pull in uh, the Oasis. And uh, bear with me for a minute because I've got to do a couple of things here to set it all up. So now we have the waveform. And once again, if we looked at the waveform, from these various things, you could perhaps see that it's starting to look similar, but not exact. Just making them all white so that we can look at them and this will turn. There we go. So you can see that we've now pulled in the Oasis, and if we. Oh, I forgot to release it from binding and I better save it before it crashes on me. Alright, now I can move it independently. So we can see that they kind of look the same but once again I'm having difficulty aligning Oasis with the under. Okay, so at this point what I would do is I would say, well, if Oasis is the same as these others then the muzzle blast must have the same timing, right? 
That's right. So let's add a pane that would contain um, the timing marks from the muzzle blast from one or more one of the uh, videos and I choose under it wouldn't matter which one and I'll show you why in a minute no I don't I choose um, the Luxor one because it only contains volley 9 so that's Hebrew let's choose the Hebrew So I choose Hebrew Muzzle Blast, and I import it into this fourth pane down here, and then I need to unlock it so it can change position, save the session, and then bring it over here. Okay. And let's change it to darker color. Let's change it to, I guess, black for the moment. Alright. So now, on the bottom pane, I have the muzzle markings from the uh, Hebrew, and According to my assertion, I should be able to line them up with some signals here. Now, you see, it's still kind of hard to do with the waveform. So what I need to do is add a, uh, a spectrogram layer for, let's see, I had spectrogram for uh, Oasis. There we go, Oasis Channel 1. And I want to make that a... A log scale. Okay, here we go. Up the things a little. All right, spread it out. And now let's start looking. Now you notice in this case that Oasis and let's let's go with the second verse here. You notice that Oasis has again the same phenomenon. It has these higher frequencies with the lower frequencies. But the highs are not as high as they were up here. You see? The high up here are running on average around 2K or better. And down here they're running below 2K. And that's because over distance the higher frequencies tend to get absorbed. They still comes, the first thing that we hear is a supersonic crack followed by this muzzle blast. And now what we want to do is find and I'll see if it lines up with, okay, there we go. So now I've got in view uh, on this bottom pane all the uh, muzzle blast from the Hebrew video up there, which I guess I could have just... Um, you know, mushed around to look the same, but it's kind of hard to do to uh, so they will line it up like that. But it's easier to compare these lines. So here we see that uh, the first muzzle blast from the Hebrew lines up with I've aligned up there, and subsequently they all kind of line up. So once again. Uh, we have demonstrated that regardless of where you're recording, the muzzle blasts faithfully record and reproduce the timing between shots. And again, if we go to the uh, log frequency plot here, you'll see that we got to get 2B over there. Come on, 2B. Where's 2B? Oh, there's 2B. Line up the muzzles. Okay, so here we have the muzzle blast. You see how they all nicely align. But up here under under in the second pane, the sonic supersonic cracks started way over to our left. And here they would they, they didn't start until right before the shot. And that's because the lag, i.e. the time of arrival between these two <coughs> um, 
events, namely the supersonic crack on the muzzle, is small for Oasis. It's small for um, the Hebrew, but the lag is large for under. So without knowing where you are relative to the bullet path, you're going to have a hard time figuring out what's going on. But in this case, the muzzle blasts all line up. So do the supersonic cracks line up anywhere? Well, right away we know that under doesn't. So if we kind of eliminate it from the picture and we just start comparing Oasis with these uh, under up there, I mean uh, Hebrew with Oasis, and let's get these precisely lined up so that we're not dicking with anybody. So now I'm going to get these precisely lined up on the muzzle. So now we can drag this line across and see if those top things uh, kind of lines up. Uh, that one definitely does not. Uh, that one definitely does not. Nope. Closer, but no cigar. Uh, that one kind of lines up. So when we compare uh, two videos having the muzzle blast lined up exactly, both of whom have small lags, you still don't get the supersonic cracks to line up. So in this case, if we were to overlay this pane up here from the Luxor with this pane from the Oasis, we would still get a cacophony of sounds that doesn't tell us a lot. Now, for Oasis, Oasis records everything faithfully and you might ask why even though it's at such a large distance and the recording that uh, the reason that Oasis records every single sonic crack and every single muzzle blast is because the background is background noise is quiet and therefore it can detect these smaller sounds called the supersonic crack even though they're at a large distance and as you can see the intensity of the muzzle blast is way greater than the intensity of the supersonic crack <clears throat> in fact, the supersonic cracks at Oasis might not be audible, but they're clearly visible in, in this spectral analysis mode. So where am I heading with this? Well, if you want to overlay audios, you better know what you're doing. If you want to combine two audios and say make an assertion about them, again, you better know what you're doing. But let's get to the grandiose statement here. Not, not, let's save the grandiose statement for later because we're going to be doing that directly. So anyway, pull these back down. We pull the under. The, the, in the middle pane here, this under audio is much like most of the audio in the venue proper. It tends to have a larger lag. The sonic, uh, supersonic cracks tend to come and go and be distorted sometimes but they're never aligned with the muzzles. Never. Whereas with these smaller distances, smaller lags rather, at these remote regions, you can tend to get a better alignment even though they still don't line up precisely. Okay, well I think I think this video is dragging on. Let's um, wrap this video up for now and we'll take take this up again tomorrow or the next day continuing on with more videos showing the same thing and what we want to get to a point is where we can take this template we can bring up any new audio that we want bring up this template for muzzle blasts overlay it on top of the new audio and and make a little bit of an, a guess as to what's happening and we're going to have to deal with some complexities like what happens to the supersonic crack when the bullet hits something because only as long as the bullet is flying are supersonic cracks created but of course all the supersonic cracks created prior to that still exist what do they do how do they propagate and what do we hear on some of these videos and that's going to become extremely important where there's a lot of hits going on in the region at which the audio is recorded okay well anyway uh, that's it for this evening we'll grab you in the next one